Welcome to the Coffee with Karen podcast, a weekly chat show discussing everything from holistic health to current affairs, from a mental, physical and spiritual perspective. Get your weekly cup of positivity with a sprinkling of woo-woo. I get a, I get a, a lot of Malachi's and occasionally a Malachi. Oh, okay. Um, Fair enough. Yeah, we can eat it, but easily solved, easily solved. So, exactly. awesome. So we're there. Right. So welcome to a coffee with Karen, a cup of positivity with just a sprinkling of a woo-woo. So this show every week, um, I have guests talking about whatever topic they want to talk about, but from either a mental, a physical or a spiritual perspective. That's our sprinkling of woo-woo. Now, your host today, my name's Karen Roberts, and I suppose with my own business, I do combine the mental, the physical and the spiritual. So if anybody wants to get in touch, go to karenrobertscoaching.com. But today, my guest, Malachi, is going to be speaking um, really more from the spiritual perspective. So this definitely, there is going to be a little bit of woo-woo. So the power of pattern interrupt. Well, I'm actually going to allow Malachi to explain a little bit about that. So Malachi, if you could explain to the listeners a little yep. bit of who you are, what you do, um, and share a little bit of your story, please. Okay. Um, thank you very much for having me on the show, first of all, Karen. I'm delighted to be here. And it, it, the title and your tagline, you know, health, physical, spiritual, mental, psychological, all combined together kind of jumped out at me. And, you know, with a little bit of woo-woo, that, okay, I definitely kind of tick those boxes. Um, I suppose I'm coming from a background of having a degree in health and exercise science and also circus themed entertainment and circus skills performance. So quite a background in personal performance and working and, and challenging yourself to perform at a high level in sometimes high stress environments. and. Health related fitness. That was where I started out with things. But I suppose, in terms of a pattern interrupt, we've seen a massive one uh, over the last year and a uh, near year and a half, really, now, where a pattern interrupt simply is something that stops you in your tracks, interrupts your normal pattern, your, your day to day habits, because we go through most of our lives on autopilot. About 80 or 90% of what we do is just completely habit and autopilot driven. So a pattern interrupt is anything that just literally stops you in your tracks and makes you go, stop. And in social media, we see this in ads that are kind of strange or weird or quirky, something that stops you from scrolling. And that's what marketers and advertisers are looking for with their, their in-feed in ads is something that will stop you from scrolling. Well, for me, in my own life, uh, something that was a very big pattern interrupt was an otter appearing in front of me when I was about to do something stupid and very drastic. And um, I was about to end my own life, literally. And I was at the water's edge. My pockets were filled with stones. And I don't mean that in any metaphorical sense. I mean, I was literally had filled the the pockets of my cargo pants with stones and I was about to go for a walk in the Atlantic and um, yeah I wasn't in a good place I really wasn't and that otter for me represented a pattern interrupt because it it was otters are uh, generally kind of shy quiet nocturnal not quite solitary but almost solitary uh, apart from their own immediate kind of familial unit they're generally solitary. It's very rare normally that you would see them. Right. And in the sea, did you say this was the sea, not a in river? The, in the sea, yeah. Right at the, where I, I live is pretty close to the, the shore of the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, it's a, a little town called Ker uh, Tralee in County Kerry in southwest corner of Ireland. And that, that spot would have been about four or 
maybe five kilometers away from where I lived. And I had walked to that point with the intention to end my life. So it wasn't exactly a, you know, a spur of the moment thing. I'd, you know, I'd just done a 5k walk. So it took me about an hour to, to get there. So wow. I would have had in that time, I would have had time to change my mind and I hadn't. Mm. But it, it was this otter appearing up in front of me that was a pattern interrupt. Wow. Because my thought process that led me to that, I'm sorry if it's a, a bit deep, um, was I, I remember thinking as I was, you know, on the, the standing on the, the bank of, of the sea, and I was thinking, you know, no one will miss me when I'm gone, or who would have even miss me, and there was nobody coming to mind. Um, you know, what difference will it make if I'm gone? And the only thing I could think of was, well, you know, somebody will notice when I don't show up for work tomorrow, but, you know, I'll be replaced in a couple of days. Um, I was, yeah, I was in a really, I was down in a hole. I had, my reserves were exhausted. Um, I'd had enough and I couldn't see any way of things improving. Right, but the, which is happening mm -hmm. so much, oh my goodness, so much over this past year, right? Yep. And it was the, the isolation, I think, currently it's the isolation for so many people and the lack of contact. At that time, though, I felt like I was the loneliest creature on the planet. I felt that uh, I was so, so alone. And this was the, the one thing. It was an overwhelming sense of loneliness and isolation. And then this otter pops up in front of me and as if to say, look, you're not alone. You'd say you're solitary. You say you're alone. Look at me. I'm solitary. I'm alone. And yet I'm here for you. Wow. Um, and the reason the otter for me was significant was as a teenager and as a, well, even as a youngster, uh, we lived in the center of Ireland. My family had a farm. There was a river running by some of the fields and there was a, a spot in one corner where there was just, a, I suppose, almost like um, an inflow where the river would flow in and it formed a little alcove. And it was just a, a really nice camp spot. It was a little... A, a, a good spot for swimming for me in the summer because it was mm -hmm. not actually out in the river it was safe and i remember i was fascinated by otters and by wildlife as a kid and used to watch the nature programs on tv and had some of the books by the the various naturalists that were living in ireland and i had a fascination with otters and i would see the tracks on the bank and i would see their their markings and their droppings but i never saw an otter huh. And for years, I would go down the land at night while my parents were asleep, while the rest of the world was asleep, when otters should have been out and about. And I would creep down quietly, as quiet as I could be, as a youngster and as a teenager. And I searched for years to try and find one of these otters and never did. Knew they were there. There was obvious markings, paw prints, the whole lot. Could never find one. <laughs> until the one time which was the most important time yes then, wow what a that, then that solitary creature was there for me when i needed it so you could call that spirituality you could call it woo woo you could call it uh a lucky happenstance coincidence serendipity the, the whatever you want to call really it matter. definitely a little bit of woo woo so for a lot of people, um, this last year has been, um, has caused a lot of people to have those kinds of feelings. So for you, when did this actually occur? This was actually about 20 years ago, maybe 24 years ago, I guess. Um, and I was working, had a, a steady job, no real career advancements in it as such. It was working in a, a hotel bar and nightclub bar. I'd kind of risen as, as far as it was possible. I was running one of four, one of, th sorry, three bars in the nightclub um, and was senior bar staff, senior staff in the hotel, but there wouldn't really have been much in the way of uh, advancement opportunity there. Um, really enjoyed the work. 
I'm very much a people person. So I got to see definitely lots of people um, between the nightclub work, the hotel bar work and function work. And you'd see people at their best and at their worst. So, you know, the old saying in vino veritas, in wine, the truth. <laughs> There's a, a, certain, a, a certain element of truth in that when people have a few drinks, the inhibitions are gone and you see where they're really at on the day. Yes. Um, but also at that time I was in kind of a, an on again, off again relationship. And I find I don't do well with uncertainty. I like, I suppose like most people, I like to have a certain amount of stability and know where I stand in, particularly in relationships, nothing worse than, than trying to figure out or guess where you're at. Um, and that relationship ended not by my choice. And um, I suppose a combination of the, the bar work lifestyle would have been drinking a lot during that time. They do say the person in any given bar most likely to become an alcoholic is the person behind the counter. And I suppose that, uh, yeah, I probably wouldn't have been too far off. I would have been, uh, you could call it a party animal or you could call it a functioning alcoholic. I don't know that in my case, there mightn't have been too much difference between the two. Uh, oh, but, yeah, uh, but at that stage, I, I was done. Um, once that, that relationship had been on again, off again, on again, off again. And um, eventually I had no more reserves left. Um, yeah, I was, I was done. And I suppose this, the, that was the stimulus for things that had been building up for a while. I suppose I'd been wearing, getting worn down my nervous system, my immune system, my resilience, being worn down through the alcohol being a depressant and it being literally an everyday part of my life. Um, that would have been the, the relationship breaking up again would have been the stimulus that just kind of the straw that broke the camel's back, tipped me. Yeah, sure. Well, beyond. all these emotional triggers and that, mm -hmm. yeah, you can see that, you know, for a lot of people, they would could have made you know deal with maybe one or somebody could do with two but then it's just these layers upon layers upon layers absolutely can, um, right and i suppose for me older and wiser now um i actually lost my dad when i was seven years old to a, a massive heart attack so there's no warning literally went to bed one night and woke up the next day and my dad was gone and that's something that in Ireland in those days there wasn't counseling available or if it was you didn't even know it existed you know this is pre-internet um so that was something I had never dealt with and I suppose that may have been a factor in terms of why I was so drawn to inebriation and seeking altered states and it is something that during COVID, uh, I did start to suffer from anxiety and did, once I realized what was going on, uh, brain fog and high heart, heart rate, I reached out to a, a counselor pretty much immediately and have been getting counseling for four or five months. Interesting. So you, uh, so actually, so that actually helped you, that enabled you to recognize the factors. Mm -hmm. Because, yeah, I'm sure, oh, and, you know, you're not alone there, right? And it's interesting Absolutely. you said, because last week, uh, last week's guest, we were talking about um, extroverts versus introverts. And it's interesting you say that you are a people person, so you're an extrovert. Mm -hmm. Lockdown, and I would class myself as an extrovert. And lockdown has really had a huge effect on us. So for the introverts, yes. they've actually been in their happy place. They're quite happy to be at home on their own, doing not very much. But for people like me or you, we're like, oh, my, God, you know, we need that social interaction. We need to be out with lots of people and we have definitely seen, it's interesting that you said that earlier because, because of literally last week's conversation on here has, you know, just made that, well, it's helped me understand that a little bit more 
as to why people like us have actually, you know, because I would have said, I, you know, I don't, I don't get depression. I, I don't suffer with this. I don't suffer with that. But oh my goodness, this whole last year, I have really, really struggled with it. And yes, you, you know, you are not alone. But it's it's so interesting that you pointed that out earlier and not knowing. Yeah. Um, so, right, so let's go back. So you had that patent interrupt mm -hmm. back then. So you you had said that you'd, you'd had this hour's walk, so you had plenty of time to, to think it through, and nothing had changed your mind till that point. So yeah. what was it about this patent interrupt that switched it around for you? It was the fact that... You know, if it had been a fish that jumped out, that would have been irrelevant. If it had been a swan, lovely, elegant creatures that they are, it still would have been irrelevant. I probably wouldn't even have noticed. But it was the personal significance for me of the otter, a creature that I had searched for for years and never found. Uh -huh. So it was like my, my golden goose isn't quite the word I'm looking for, but, you know, something I've been searching for for years and right. it was only when I was in my darkest hour, uh, about to be my final hour, and that was when I found the creature I had been searching for. Right. And oh, wow. as having told that story to um, a couple of people, uh, friends who are also coaches, and they they brought my attention to the fact that uh, in a lot of cultures and mythologies, the otter symbolizes playfulness um joy kind of energetic enthusiasm a light-heartedness and all of those are traits that i tend to have in abundance um you know i, I teach circus skills i perform all over the country or well pre-covid did uh, <laughs> and slowly but surely that's starting to come back now as we get our you know the vaccinations get rolled out and and things slowly come back to to some semblance of normality um so that you know that joyfulness that that childish or childlike i should say a bit of a <laughs> so, subtle but important difference that childlike yes. playfulness is, is something that's very very central to who i am as a person right uh, even even in my health and fitness work with my clients a lot of the time the reason people don't follow through with the health and fitness program is because it gets boring. And particularly so if they're rehabilitating from an injury or from surgery or with older adults on a falls prevention program, a lot of the exercises there for work, working balance, you go to, a, you know, particularly coming from a clinical setting, yes, they will be very good and effective, but most of the time they're done as, well, you have to do this and therefore you're going to do it because it's good for you. Mm. And we, we all know we don't always do things just because they're good for us, and particularly if we find them boring. Absolutely. So, so I always try to bring a large component of playfulness or personal challenge in with any exercise that I, I think a client is going to find boring. And I'll be able to tell relatively quickly, even before we ever start, if, you know, they find this, this uh for example, a typical balance exercise, single leg balance with one knee lifted up. So you're standing there and the goal is to hold for 30 seconds. And you should be doing that every day, three times on each leg. Mm -hmm. If you've ever done that, that is as boring as sin. It's amazing how long 30 seconds is when you have, when you're just holding it, it seems to go on forever. So yes, yes, Absolutely. I, would, I would agree for a lot of people that's gonna be, yeah. When it's boring, we don't really want to do it, do we? Oh, nope. what have you got there? This is a juggling ball, but, you know, a tennis ball, or you could have a, a highlighter or a biro, a pen, anything. If you've got to stand there and hold your leg up off the floor, let's make it more interesting. You could stand next to the counter or next to a chair and see if you can put the ball underneath your knee. Ah. So it's going around and around underneath the knee. And instantly... You forget about how long you're doing this for. Distraction. Distraction. 
And to build on that, you can start counting in your second language. How many times right. can you do it? Or saying the alphabet and things like that yeah. they distract they distract the brain so you're not getting bored and also they're challenging your balance just a little bit more because of the arms and the body are moving moving you have that movement there and that allows you to be mobile and playful in your balance yeah okay that makes a lot of sense and in fact that would make sense that actually it would be better for you because your proprioception, if you're just focusing on balancing, um, you're actually having to retrain those messages, messages that are going up your leg to your brain to tell your brain exactly where your foot is because you're thinking about something else. So actually, it's probably a, a, another level up, isn't it? it? Is. So yep. in fact, initially, people may not actually be able to do the two things, actually try to balance and be distracted by something else. So it's actually retraining their balance, their proprioception in a actually a higher, higher, higher level. And yes, like you say, they've got something to aim for, some extra challenge to go for, because yeah, it's the most, you know, I I, I know for <laughs> my clients like just trying to get them to stretch, you know, we know that stretching, you need to stretch for yes. a lot longer. Mm -hmm. um, but that we don't do it because of exactly what you've just said, boredom. Exactly. So actually um, what you've just said there is also that links back really to your story, doesn't it? That's a pattern interrupt. Correct. Yeah, it's all, all about the pattern interrupt. Anytime you're trying to change something, a pattern interrupt, and the whole damn global pandemic thing has been a pattern interrupt for literally everybody. But not a good one. <laughs> Sorry, I mean, <laughs> now, okay, let's just lay it out straight. The entire world has been living in a state of general ang generalized anxiety for the last 16 months. Literally everybody, people who have never suffered from anxiety, never had any me mental health um, worries at all. Everybody across the board has been hit with generalized anxiety. It, mm -hmm. Over the next 12 months, we are going to see a massive, massive increase in demand for counsellors, uh, therapists, and and people of that background, it, without any doubt. Um, even talking to some of my own friends who would never even have remotely considered the notion of a counsellor or a therapist before, are uh, and guys my own age and you know in their early forties, strong men who would be men's men, and yeah, they're now being that the moment they hear that somebody they know or someone one of their peers is getting counseling the doors open and it suddenly this becomes a conversation they're willing to have and that's exactly really why you're here today because you know some people think oh it's not really positive your talks so actually it is because we've got to have the conversation because yeah. this is a thing it's hidden it's not talked about and you're right, so so many, and, and it's it, I am finding it fascinating as to, and I'd really like to see stats on this because it does appear that this whole situation has affected men more so than women. And and the only reason I say that is I, I do um, I picked up a lady who works in a, a mental health part of a hospital. I won't say which hospital. Uh, but I was just sort of chatting to her and, you know, how are things, you know, have you seen a really bad increase in, you know, since since all this mess started? And she said, it's crazy. She said in, in the, so speaking to her on that day, in the previous four days, there had been three major incidents. And I, and I won't explain what had happened, but major incidents with men all in about their 50s, early 50s. All of them, no history of mental health um, mm -hmm. issues. All of them, quite a high powered job. One was a, a hedge fund guy. One was, uh, I don't know, that kind of thing, sort of city boy. Um, they, so they all had quite high powered job. I, I, I didn't know what their, whether they were living alone, whether they had, I don't, didn't know any of that. 
Okay. But it's just very interesting that out of any of the people that I also know this past year, very sadly, the suicides have been men. Yeah. And maybe it is because we are not having the conversation. So in some way they're feeling like they're, not good enough or whatever because of what's happened. But actually, no, they are. This is just a situation that we've all found ourselves in. Yeah. And that there is help. We do need to just talk there about is, it. Or like yeah. for you, have a pattern interrupt, right? Yeah. And that pattern interrupt is, uh, well, it actually, it took the legs out from under me. Um, I, I, I had, you know, gone down towards the water edge to find a big rock to carry as well as having my pockets filled with stones i was you know and what is curious the things that go through your head i was thinking i wonder how far i'll get before i drop the stone i wonder how far i'll get before the phone in my pocket stops working um and then the otter popped up and literally dropped me on my arse on the rocks at a sore backside for about a week after um <laughs> but just complete literally floored me that this otter should pop up and I don't mean it's like way out in the bay. I mean, literally just beyond arm's reach. I, I could almost, almost wow. touch this otter. Uh, haven't searched for years to find one without success. Wow. But that, that otter was a pattern interrupt that got me out of my, I'm all alone. I'm the loneliest creature on the planet. No one will miss me if I'm gone. And this otter just popped up in front of me and looked straight at me and continued to stare straight at me. and just stay there. And this was going on for what seemed like hours. It was probably closer to about 10 or 15 minutes. But even so, that's an inordinate amount of time for a random wild animal to pop up and stare at you and then stayed there until I had, my thought process was completely scrambled. Um, and I realized I would be missed. And I emptied the stones out of my pockets and took the phone out and uh, started walking home and it was about five in the morning and i made a phone call and talked uh, and the tears were streaming down my face as i was talking um i remember walking back in along and i was literally everything that had troubled me for years was coming out it was just it was literally like the floodgates had opened there you go. Incredible. What an incredible experience. And so from that point, how has that affected? So how what 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 effect did that have on you moving forward? Um, I suppose I realized that no matter how bad things got, take the phone out. We all have them. Um, and even if you have no credit, you, there's still 999 or 112, depending on where you are. There's always someone at the end of the phone, no matter how bad things get. And for me, it made me realize that pattern interrupt made me realize that no matter how bad things are now, in a moment, now is gone, and there's an opportunity for better. Now is gone. Now, by the time you've thought about now, it no longer exists and you're onto another moment and every single moment is an opportunity for an improvement when you reach rock bottom the only way is up i mean i'm starting to sound completely cliched now but when you're reached that absolute low point the only way is up and there's you know it's so frightening to me that i was going to take a permanent bad mm -hmm. decision over something that really was temporary yeah. yeah temporary feeling and that is it i suppose for so many people everything um is, can seem so static mm -hmm. and so solid and things are never going to change and you know you say about cliches but you know all these sayings they are so true whether they're cliche or not it's irrelevant because the truth is the truth there's no so all these things this too shall pass because it does 
if nothing stays there's nothing i know it may feel like the last year nothing's changed but it does right they were there none of it stays exactly the same so and that goes for good and for the bad exactly. so you know we are just living our whole lives in this constant fluctuating up and down up and down and yeah we've got to learn to ride the wave rather than stay down when we are down we stay down and at the end of the day it's just it's all stories yes. when we realize it's all stories that we create in our mm -hmm. head because none of it's actually real i mean like for you 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 went through this whole thought process oh i'm not going to be missed right you now know mm -hmm. that you that wasn't true that wasn't a truth you would have been yeah. sorely missed oh I, my family would have been utterly devastated my friends would have been utterly devastated i mean the litter, it would have left a trail of pain and, and destruction behind or i would have left a trail of pain and destruction behind me if i had followed through and I, I had fully intended to follow through until the pattern interrupt. There you go. It's, it, it's fascinating how we can, how anybody can get ourselves into that just feeling so static and no moving. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it is all, and it is all, all it's all, all only temporary. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting, something I, I said kind of quite early in COVID, even before anxiety or anything happened, it was that the whole shutdown of the entire world, more or less, was a pattern interrupt and potentially a good one. Pattern interrupt by itself is, isn't necessarily either good or bad. It's just it's just a pattern interrupt. It's a stop and think. And that's what it is. It's a stop. Stop mindly, mindlessly scrolling on social media or stop mindlessly drifting through your life on autopilot. Pattern interrupt is it an opportunity to stop and think, is what I'm doing now, is this course of action serving me well? Or is it likely to be harmful and counterproductive? And, you know, very acutely there on the water's edge, the course of action I was about to take would have been incredibly harmful, both for me and for my little bubble of the world. COVID has caused many people to stop and, and look at the par their lives mm -hmm. and their courses of action, their choices. And a lot of people have started to make healthier choices uh having the time spending more time at home half the world learned how to cook sourdough bread <laughs> I, I, I don't know maybe that was just a, an irish thing but over here it was huge the first few months of lockdown was you know sourdough bread everybody was you go on social media and people are looking for starters for sourdough bread but it was <laughs> Part of it was a novelty factor, look, trying to alleviate the boredom, trying to find something new to do. But part of it was they had a pattern interrupt and recognize that you can do things differently in some way, shape or form. There, can there be a better way of doing things? A lot of people now are going to be mixing working from home with working in the office, kind of two to three oh. days a week of each, where previously working from home would have, wouldn't have been entertained by their employer. But suddenly employers are realizing we don't necessarily need to have people in the office. If people enjoy their work, they will do the work well. You don't have to stand over them like a slave driver cracking a damn whip. Yeah, I mean, that does depend. I think that depends on the company. <laughs> so there are some. <laughs> you're yeah. absolutely right. The ones that have recognized that you're right, trust. You know, trust the people to do the work. You don't need to be monitoring every second. Have were there any keystrokes on the computer, or you know, where were they? What they're doing? Just yeah. you know, go by the end result. Did they get the work done? Yes or exactly. no. Whereas, unfortunately, the ones that are coming from a place of fear of work not getting done are trying to control everything and monitor. You know, cough, you know, you're a bit too long going for a cup of coffee or whatever, which is a shame, isn't it? So I, I would agree. Mm -hmm. I, I hope that this pattern interrupt has caused, like you say, for many, the ones that have, uh, have been furloughed. So for them, really, there's been no hardship necessarily mm -hmm. if they were getting 80 percent of their full pay. And at home, I think for them, they've they, they've been in a great position because. They have been allowed to 
hmm, look at their lives. Is this what I really want? And in that meantime, they might have even retrained in something that they would be more passionate about. Yeah. So that is definitely a plus. And like you say, the others that may be realise they don't have to commute miles to and from work every day. And hopefully their employers will realise that to get the best out of them, because we realise when we get the best out of people, we've got to treat them with respect, treat them, you know, just, yep. you know, if they're going to get the job, just leave them alone, you know. <laughs> leave them be. You don't have Absolutely. to be sat at your desk for X amount of hours. Just get it done. So, yes, I do think there's a lot of positives to come out of this pattern interrupt. Yeah, However, so there are still people like you and me that are more extrovert that, and they may not have been in that financially good position. Some have really struggled. So for you knowing what you know on a personal level because you've been through it and survived it, what would you say to anybody who is maybe out there that hasn't had that cushion for them and are maybe feeling like they're struggling and that there is no way out. What would you um, say to them? I, I think come, based on my own experience, um, you know, there's so many things you can do in terms of helping to alleviate anxiety, depression, um, the, the whole the whole gamut of shall we say the 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 down the downward spiral of mm -hmm. mental health you know you talk about getting regular exercise eating a balanced diet uh meditating things like that i was doing all those things i'm a health and fitness professional i teach classes a few times a week um i meditate not as often as i try to but i do meditate a couple of times a week or at least I'll spend five minutes focused on my breathing, just counting the breaths, counting the length of time in and out. Um, regular exercise, healthy balanced diet, you know, a good variety of fruit and veg and getting the different colors of vegetables in. So getting a broad spectrum of nutrients. And I was still suffering with anxiety. So it's possible that you can still be doing all the right things and not feel 100% and that's okay. That's not on you. That's just where we find ourselves in the world. Yeah, sure. So much, and it, and so, yeah, like so you say, it's re not. Reach out. It's it's okay, and that is the thing. Is mm -hmm. do you, it is a, it's okay to feel like crap one day. Excuse yeah. my French, but do you know what that you know that is part of life as well. Like sometimes I think there's so much. There's also could be potentially so much pressure on us to be feeling yeah everything's great everything's wonderful and no it, we don't always feel like that so actually sometimes the more we resist against it the more we're actually attracting it <laughs> more yeah. to us so yeah, yeah you say about you covered the mental side a lot of the physical sides of right nutrition right exercise yeah maybe everybody needs a little bit of woo woo in their lives right <laughs> I, I think so and in terms of woo woo, and this is going to be coming really out from left field. So, I, but I, I think Karen, you're going to be okay with this one. Um, so, on the the circus background, the old magician's phrase "abracadabra," mm -hmm. that actually has really ancient origins, and there's a little bit of debate amongst about the exact origin of this word or expression. It's tied down between coming from ancient Sumerian and ancient Hebrew. And on both sides, it roughly translates as by my words, so I create, or my words make real. Love it. So you take that and you take it back to yourself. What words are you using to describe yourself? And most of us will have a, a, a tendency to describe ourselves more harshly or to speak to ourselves more harshly than we would to our friends. 100%. So a little pattern interrupt for you is when you find yourself speaking very harshly to yourself or thinking very harshly at yourself, 
would you say that to a friend? And how long do you think they would remain your friend if you spoke to them like that on a regular basis? There you go. Because I know from talking to my clients, some of the mental scripts we have, if our friends were to say those things to us on a regular basis, we would drop them like a bag of crap. Absolutely. To do some some French myself here. Um, <laughs> We're Sorry, so harsh to ourselves, so harsh to ourselves, so often. And particularly as if the more often you're harsh to yourself, the more of a habit it becomes. The more often you repeat that phrase, the more real it becomes. And this thing even has a background in neuroscience. In neuroscience, they say neurons that fire together, wire together. So when you reach a decision or a judgment, the synapses, the pathways in the brain, that, that uh, decision has triggered along the way the more often you reach that decision or the more often often you go through that thought process those neurons get a little bit thicker a little bit stronger mm -hmm. the signal can pass faster until eventually you get from point a to point b where are we yeah oh, from point point a to point b lickety split whereas at the start you kind of thought about for a few seconds like oh well oh, I'm, I'm crap at this because you tried it and you didn't do well. If you're trying anything new, congratulations. Be crap. Yeah. Give yourself the freedom to be crap. We all suck at stuff when we're beginners. Exactly. The more often you try something, the better you get at it. Goes for both saying positive things about yourself and saying negative things. So if you're saying constantly, oh, I'm crap or I can't, your brain is listening, your body is listening, and you're changing your physiology by repeating that. Yeah, so, and guess what? <laughs> pattern interrupt. <laughs> there you go. That's so that's what you need even in that time. So yeah, you're 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 so right. We all again, you know, okay, maybe some of us don't, but so the one then we it tends to have this habitual pattern or we have been conditioned somehow yep. to speak negatively to ourselves because I suppose also we've been brought up to believe that you know speaking good about ourselves that's 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 not very humble and that's not you know that's showing off or that's so we actually have been taught throughout our lives from children to mm -hmm. actually not do the positive aspect because that's being cocky or that's being you know so then we get more conditioned to do the negative side of it, which does have a knock-on effect. And, I, and I've spoken to, you know, I people who are adults now who really, um, you know, suffer up with their mental health. And my thought process is, you, but you weren't always like that. So that means, you know, that's not you. That's that's a habit that you've just found yourself reacting in that certain way, just like you say, because they've done it over and over and over again, but that's not who they are. You know, babies are born perfect. Exactly, and, and babies, a baby trying to learn to walk is gonna try and fail hundreds of times. Yeah. They're fall on his face, there will be tears, absolutely, Doesn't along stop the way. Them. <laughs> nope, they, they learn, they see other people doing it, and they go, I can do it, they can do it, therefore there's a good chance I can do it as well. So quite often, it is, it is going back to even like the stories that we tell ourselves, it's all coming from us. Yep. It's and, all and it, coming from us, but also that's so empowering because we actually don't need anybody else to solve the problem for us because it's within. Yep. And that, that little voice sometimes that you hear as well that can be holding you back. And you might think, well, you know, this is, it's kind of, it, it, it's keeping me safe or it's, it's keeping me within my limits. Uh, one of my running clients a while back, a uh, lady in her early 50s. And just the topic of, of kind of the, the voice in your head that holds you back is kind of our, our theme as we were running along. And I asked, the members of my, my group, the voice in your head that says you can't go any faster or you can't go any farther or you need to slow down and take a rest while you're running, whose voice is that? What does it sound like? Because for me, I know that voice is very 
strict and stern and authoritative. And I can't associate it with anybody except it's it's not my voice, but it's coming from me. I don't know if that even mm -hmm. makes sense. Maybe a little bit of woo. Um, <laughs> but this particular client told me that her voice in her head that tells her to, to slow down or she can't run that fast or she can't run any faster or she can't run for any longer. This lady in her mid fifties, that voice was her secondary school gym teacher. Uh. And 40 years later, that voice, and even though the gym teacher actually, she'd said was very nice to them and very encouraging, very positive, the association was there mm. that when it came to physical things, this was the voice that was telling her that she could wow. do it. Isn't it funny that we hold on to so much from when we're children? It's like, mm -hmm. but we're an adult now. <laughs> mm -hmm. yep. I'm not going to have, if only we could just have a little word with ourselves. Like, come on. <laughs> that was and then. This is now. But we do. We, so many of us carry so many of these patterns from very young ages. Absolutely. And we're bringing them into the now. Mm -hmm. And because until I suppose, we do have the conversation because a lot of this is habitual and we haven't had the conversation. So there's no need to change things because it's habitual because we yep. haven't been made aware until you actually bring it in front of you and realize that that's me reacting to that thing, whatever it is, as mm -hmm. a seven year old. <laughs> yeah, but hang on, I'm, <laughs> I'm 49 years old now. So I would react differently. It's yep. so fascinating what we, you're right, how we talk to ourselves has a huge, huge, because that's actually, yeah, of course it's more powerful because it's coming from us. It's our voice. Yep. Um, I've, I've, I've taken the tack when I catch myself with that negative voice, particularly it works. I, I'm very uh, kinesthetic being in, in health and fitness and being in circus, very bodily based. Uh, mm -hmm. So I, I suppose in terms of learning things, when I do things with my hands, I learn so much better than reading, writing, or screen, uh, mm -hmm. or hearing. But in terms of breaking that that pattern, so my pattern interrupt for the physical stuff, mm -hmm. or, or the voice that says you can't, or slow down, or you've been, you know, you've you've gone far enough now, take a little break. Mickey Mouse after sucking on a helium balloon. <laughs> Get that voice in your head, and that's now your inner critic. So anytime that inner critic kicks off, Mickey Mouse sucking on a helium balloon, <laughs> totally cuts the legs out from underneath that authoritative voice. Right. I put this into practice a few times to, to break that habit. I was out for a run one day along by a river bank, and there's a, a nice river walk here in, in Tralee. And there was a, an older couple coming towards me. Um, look, very cute. They were probably in their early 70s, walking arm in arm, really lovely. And I was struggling on my run and I was, going, I was huffing and puffing. I sounded like the big bad wolf about to blow down the, the three little pigs house and gasping for air. But I knew I should have more in the tank, but the little voice was kicking in. My authoritative voice saying, oh, you know, uh, you're, you can't go any faster than this. You're at the end of your limit. You know, you need to slow down. So I imagine that was Mickey Mouse after sucking on a helium balloon. Hey, you can't go any faster than this. You need to slow down. I started busting out loud laughing and I didn't have headphones in or, or anything. So I'm just here running along, <laughs> red faced, sweat pouring down me, gasping for air. And all of a sudden I just break out laughing, La literally laugh out loud laughter. And this couple started and they looked at me like I was a maniac. They, uh, ah, but it worked. It worked. I, I managed to keep going. So that was and your pattern interrupt, interrupt. That was my pattern interrupt. The moment I hear that little voice come in, that negative voice being stern and authoritative, bang, get the axe, cut the legs out from underneath them with Mickey Mouse on helium. So and that's, that's it. quite interesting that, in that's and of take itself. That's because a takeaway. Rip the authority. That is out. a brilliant takeaway. And that links back to what you said. Oh, what did you say? You said something earlier 
that I found quite interesting. And, and it's about, it's almost like the serious, you know, when, when we're in that place of, you know, not feeling great, you know, mm -hmm. so this last year, everything is actually really serious. Yeah. It's all serious. Yeah. So actually having that lighter, you know, childlike, like you said <laughs> earlier, and like even for that pattern interrupt, you've just, you've made yourself laugh from some funny uh, children's voice. Mm -hmm. So it is, I mean, it's just another way of saying, man, don't sweat the small stuff. Yeah. And it's all small stuff, as the book says. We yeah. take everything so seriously. When we lighten up a little bit, Mm -hmm. and see things for what they really are and then like you say put a blooming put a little silly childish voice on on the end of something to just take that seriousness out of it yeah. lighten up the mood that is is, is a pattern interrupt in itself right because it isn't totally. you know why is life why does life have to be so serious it doesn't no, that's no, again no. a story that's a story that we tell ourselves that you know now we've got to a certain age we've got to start acting serious well i never will quite obviously no, nor i <laughs> um, you know clown, clowning is a, an important aspect of what i do in terms of performance so the chances of me being serious it's, i have serious moments, so moments yeah there you go are. as we all will and and i think mm. that's an important thing to state is like I'm not all well, happy and you know everything's wonderful every 24 hours a day seven days a week we all have moments all of us and but then that's all it, unless we give it so much emotional attachment that's all we, it, it will ever be just a moment it's just a passing moment yeah our as lives you said will earlier, be as you said earlier ride the wave uh, it has highs know. it has lows and you know, balance. People think balance is is something that's static. It's not. It's the opposite. It's completely dynamic. Balance involves highs and lows. It involves swaying from side to side. No tightrope walker ever did well by standing in one place indefinitely on one leg. Static. Even even they when they look like they're static, they're actually shifting the pole from side to side to maintain weight balance is constantly go. moving and in life as well as in the circus your balance is constantly changing adjusting some days we'll have more stress some days we'll have less some days you need more physical energy you need more calories some days you need less a netflix marathon requires substantially less eating than running a marathon <laughs> but funnily enough, you're probably going to eat more during the Netflix marathon than you are while you're running the marathon. So there you go. <laughs> try to find the balance in things. Yes. And have fun doing it. There you go. It is having fun. There, there you go. So that's the that's probably the moral of the story. The pattern interrupt has got to be is <laughs> be fun. Just like really an otter. I mean, although it was a serious subject, the fact that it was an otter, the fact that it was an animal that you had been searching for all your life just popped yeah. up must have been <laughs> i mean i'm sure you would Mind. have actually laughed in a different set of circumstance but still having that lighter thing is yeah. all the way yeah. so that does seem to be the moral of this 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 story actually um yeah. have a, fun. a long and winding story have fun there you go because that is what it is this whole lockdown has knocked the fun out of everything we're not allowed to do this we're not allowed to do that we're not allowed to stand up we're not allowed to dance we're not allowed to sing we're not allowed to go to the cinema we're not allowed to go to the all the fun has been forcibly removed or they've tried to remove it from us yeah. but we can still find ways right mm -hmm. they can't oh, keep we... us down they can't keep us down forever we can find our own ways of lightening the mood um, even if it's just <laughs> even hearing a voice in your head that sounds like Mickey Mouse <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sucking yeah. from a helium balloon. Get some helium balloons yourself. <laughs> <that would> be... <laughs> oh, I don't know what I'm recommending now. Hang on. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's fine for one or two breaths. But then after that, asphyxiation can be an issue. So yes, <laughs> yeah, so if your lips start to turn blue, stop. Here. 
yeah. there you go so we've got to be careful on our recommendations so okay so um maliki explain about what you do what your business is how what how you you help people personally um so i do my main area of business is coaching so it's one-to-one -one coaching and it's health for personal performance really is the basis of what i do and whether that's performance at work in your your personal life whether it's you just want to lose weight that you've struggled with for a number of years. You maybe you've set goals in the past that seem to be ticking the boxes. You know, you've probably heard of smart goal setting, specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, timed. It's a really good way of setting goals. It does have its limitations, though. So I generally help people with smarter goal setting by going leaving logic on the shelf at first and finding the emotion behind the actual goal what's the importance of it why is it significant to you and i use the expression find a why that brings a tear to your eye because when you have that you have an emotion driven goal and those are the ones that actually matter to you so often in health and fitness, I'm going to use an example of weight loss because that seems to be mm -hmm. the, the initial goal that most people have or that most clients would come in with until they realize the number on the scale is actually the least of their concerns and they've got a much more important personal reason behind this, an emotion-driven reason. And it normally takes a few layers of questioning to get to that. And sometimes I'll get called... A variety of colorful and um, interesting names. Normally, <laughs> when I'm about four whys deep, and why? I get, I, I get again childlike in that I keep asking why, 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 yeah. and I'm not, yeah. I'm not going to be flippant about it. But if you if you come in to me and say you want to lose eight pounds, my answer would be why. Hmm. And the, on the surface, it'll be. You know, it might be because I'm going on holiday and I want to look good. Okay, why? Why is that important to you? Uh, or it could be because I want to fit into my wedding dress. Um, why is that important? To you? I know, obviously, on the surface, you know why fitting mm -hmm. into the wedding dress is going to be important. You know, wedding, big, most fantastic day of your life. There's always something that little bit deeper, though. There's always something that's a really strong emotion. And when you find that really strong emotional driver, then you can really get past everything that's stopping you. Because if you have set yourself a plan where you're going to exercise three times a week and you've had a, a crappy week at work and or the kids have been giving you hell and you're just feeling drained and the prospect of a workout it just makes you want to pull the pillow up over your head and, yeah. and just have a lie in. If you have a really strong emotion driven, why the moment that the thought of that training session, not workout, and I'm being careful with my language, mm -hmm. the, the thought of that training session mightn't still inspire you or fill you with joy, but then you will immediately think of why you're doing it. And that's the moment where your eyes missed, you throw back the duvet, you get up, you get out, you get on with it, and you get it done. And then you feel great. You don't have to, I, I don't love exercise. I come from a, a, a background of being heavily overweight, low self-esteem, and uh, very much on a path to disabling myself through my poor lifestyle of poor food choices and being physically inactive. And even as a teenager, I was seeing the results of that. And it was a, a path, you know, there, like other many other things, I had a pat pattern interrupt. Back to the yeah. pattern interrupt. There you go. And it was a moment, an absolute moment of clarity. I'm done with this. This there changes. And literally overnight, changed a heap of habits. And it wasn't easy but it wasn't difficult mm. 
it wasn't rocket science. I identified a few key things that were holding me back and making me miserable. I took action on them. And as I was making progress, I could ease up a little bit when I needed a break. And that's the same kind of philosophy as I take with my coaching. We find what's important. We find the reason why it's important. And then we look at all the obstacles, all the things that get in your way, and we just either find ways to get around them, get over them, uh, or find a pattern the possibility. <laughs> a pattern interrupt, exactly. How did how go. did you how did you think of such a fabulous thing to say? There you go. So how can people get in? Uh, thank you for your time today, Malachi. So a pleasure. The, the listeners, if you can, if wherever you're listening to this or watching this, you'll have yep. all of Malachi's details. But to, just to the listeners on Mint Wave Radio, if they can't see that, how would they get in contact with you? That would be holisticbalance.ie. And you'll know you're in the right place when you see the otter. There you go. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time. I'm so glad. I'm so grateful to that otter. There you yeah, go. me I'm too. Very, very, very glad me. that you had that pattern interrupt and that you can share your story with other people to hopefully become that pattern interrupt for them. So thank you very much for the time. Thank to you, all the Karen. listeners, I will be back next Monday at 2 p.m. for a Coffee with Karen. Thank you for listening. Bye. Welcome to the Coffee with Karen podcast, a weekly chat show discussing everything from holistic health to current affairs from a mental, physical and spiritual perspective. Get your weekly cup of positivity with a sprinkling of woo-woo.